Alamosaurus San Juanensis, the true armored titan and the biggest animal to ever walk on North America. Can it survive in the age of mammals? We'll be placing 100 adult Alamosaurus in Pleistocene India and tracking whether they thrive or get eaten alive, analyzing their home, how they deal with hunger, and the dangers of hanger, or threats and competitors. A 1 means they'd swiftly get driven extinct. A 5 indicates they'd stay stable without making ecological waves. A 10 is complete and total domination within their niche. We'll also explore how Alamosaurus might evolve to suit its new environment. You like ocean-going sauropods? We've got ocean-going sauropods. First, let's look at home. Microfossil environmental studies show that early Pleistocene India had a wide variety of environments, including bushlands, wooded grasslands, sand-covered plains, seasonal water source areas, and even forested mountains, with the overall vegetation pattern indicating a tropical, subtropical human climate. Monsoons were common, but not consistently timed. This resulted in lots of shallow bodies of water of medium nutritional value. Average annual temperatures varied between 21 and 25 Celsius, or 70 to 77 Fahrenheit. Grasslands were beginning to spread widely across the Indian subcontinent, leading to the success of many charismatic megamammals like rhinos. Compare that to the Alamosaurus' native land of late Cretaceous North America. It's known from multiple semi-arid formations that included seasonal floodplains and were home to small reptiles, mammals, amphibians, and fish, as well as other large dinosaurs. Areas like the North Horn and Ojo Alamo formations were definitely warmer than Pleistocene India, but not massively so. With broadly similar average temperatures, this Cenozoicification spot wouldn't feel too different from home, and the biome diversity of India during this time period would allow plenty of opportunities for subpopulations to spread out. That being said, an overall decrease in temperature would still be felt, and grasslands are entirely alien to the sauropod. Alamosaurus gets a 7 out of 10 for home. Hunger. Very little is known about Alamosaurus' diet, given the lack of skull material. Teeth have been recovered, however, and given their peg shapes, Alamosaurus likely stripped leaves from tall trees like many other sauropods. The conifers it was used to in the Cretaceous were still around in the Pleistocene, especially near mountainous areas, but deciduous trees were far more common than before. Sauropods' enormous guts were large in order to allow for long fermentation times of the plant matter they ate, breaking down vegetation in a vat of bacteria and acid. While conifers may be Alamo's preferred material, perhaps leading to a higher population density near mountains, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't have been happy chomping on the more modern trees that littered the grasslands and low elevation forests. After all, angiosperms had already spread across the world by the late Cretaceous, so the only true limiting factor in terms of what trees were best to eat would be their height. Given that an adult Alamosaurus could stand 12 meters tall at the head, they'd be chomping on the vegetation that no other terrestrial vertebrate could dream of reaching. That's an 8 out of 10 for hunger. Hanger. Very little in Earth's history could threaten a fully grown sauropod, at least in terms of predators. Competing with them to make sure they don't get big is much easier. What does the Pleistocene have to offer? Would anything go after the treetops that Alamosaurus specialized in? Elephus planifrons was a grass grazer elephantid, and a small one at that. Not likely competition. Elephus hysodricus was a mixed grazer browser around the size of an Indian elephant. It would compete with young Alamosaurus for low branches and perhaps engage in rough and tumble territorial disputes over resources. It's one to watch out for. Cevatherium giganteum is the closest morphological analog to Alamosaurus. This giraffe relative was around 800 kilograms and engaged in mixed browsing and grazing. It would butt heads, metaphorically and perhaps literally, with toddler sauropods, putting pressure on their mutual food supplies. Stigodon ganesa had tusks nearly 4 meters long in the largest individuals, extremely close to one another. They perhaps were an adaptation for digging that let it focus on roots and tubers. Despite its formidable weapons and 6-ton bulk, it wouldn't have had much reason to engage in conflict with towering sauropods. Then there's everyone's favorite supergiant elephant, Paleoloxodon nematicus. Estimates on its size vary, with the largest confirmed somewhat complete subadult individual at 13 tons. If you include projected adult sizes and lost, unverified remains, it may have pushed over 20 tons. That's nowhere near as large as the biggest Alamosaurus, which have more reliable specimens in the 30 to 40 ton range and fragments implying 70 plus tons, but still respectable. Pinematicus lived primarily in grasslands and was a grazer. There honestly wouldn't be any direct competition between the giant elephant and the even larger reptile, as entertaining as that would be. Horses, deer, rhinos, and camels also took advantage of the plentiful grasslands. They'd regard the sauropod interlopers with curiosity and likely fear, but I don't foresee significant overlap in terms of diet. Hippopotamids went extinct in India around 1.7 million years ago. That's important later. Small mammals like canids, hyenas, and mustelids would be like specks of dust to an adult, but would likely chow down on hatchling and very young Alamosaurus. 
Sauropods, pound for pound, are not heavily defended, and it's unknown to what extent the young of Alamosaurus would have had osteoderms. Given that the incubation time of most dinosaur eggs was around two months, there would need to be a level of pre-hatching parental care to prevent raids by small mammals and other egg thieves. After hatching, it's suggested that sauropod young were precocial and would have formed herds with individuals of the same age. But it's a poorly understood aspect of their behavior. They were certainly not without their defenses, having evolved in a world where cat-sized carnivorous mammals were after them from birth. The largest predators in the area would have been big cats like tigers and Asiatic lions. While the cats are threatening by Cenozoic standards, Alamosaurus and the North Horn Formation had to deal with the most powerful terrestrial predator from the fossil record, Tyrannosaurus rex itself. Adult Alamos are about as threatened by the Pleistocene apex predators as a giraffe would be by a house cat. Early hominids already had Acheulean stone tools by 1.07 million years ago, and were known to take down prey animals of elephant size. Megafaunal extinctions from human hunting don't appear to have occurred en masse until much later in the Pleistocene, but they would have absolutely had a negative impact on Alamosaurus population. Early hominids would steal eggs, harvest young, and occasionally take on adults with their stone tools. Hunting full-grown Alamosaurus would be incredibly rare, however. The sauropod was more than twice the size of the largest land mammal ever, and any attempt to take it down would result in heavy casualties even for a well-armed group of human-like apes. Alamosaurus, with its enormous size, digest everything fermentation chamber, and near immunity to predation, gets a 7. It would earn higher, but the development of more advanced tools by humans later on in the Pleistocene would be a serious threat. Until then, however, it doesn't directly compete with anything as an adult and would only have a handful of competitors when young. Alamosaurus's overall Thrive Retin Alive score is a hearty 7.3, putting it in the stable and successful range. Any adaptations would likely be minimal, given its uncontested position as apex herbivore in a fairly comfortable environment. But that's not very fun, is it? Let's take a look at some far future descendants of the Cenozoic Alamosaurus, assuming it speciates and doesn't get overhunted by technologically advanced humans. Akita Venator Kile, Spike Hunter Fortress. The ancestors of these Alamosaurus took advantage of the empty super predator niche. While many large herbivores today are known to eat carrion, bones, or small animals in order to obtain essential minerals, as well as a protein boost, Alamosaurus took those tendencies a few dozen steps forward. It began consuming high amounts of bones from elephant and sauropod carcasses in order to aid in osteoderm development for intraspecific combat. That progressed into consuming the meat on the bodies it found, and its more developed osteoderms became weapons perfect for taking down other giant quadrupeds. The spike-like battering ram on its chest is called a red monsoon, since upon stabbing a Paleoloxodon or Alamosaurus, so much blood is released that rivers of it cover the soil. To aid in this brutal hunting tactic, its tail muscles and hind limbs have become more adapted for high-speed chases. It's still slow, being a 50-ton animal on average, but much faster than other creatures in its size class. Its neck dramatically shortened and its skull convergently evolved theropod-like features, enabling a powerful bite to crush bone and finish off prey that the ram doesn't kill. Its gut has also decreased in size, since its original deluxe suite of bacterial soup is no longer required to digest a diet of mostly meat. Humans, rather than seeing the Akita Venator as an enemy, regard it as a semi-divine being sent by the god of war Murugan. It's considered a sign of bravery to steal Akita Venator eggs and raise the young, which are powerful assets in capturing cities and wiping out enemy infantry and cavalry. The Archer Haudah Akita Venator unit was the trademark of the ruler Ashoka the Great, who spread his empire across nearly all of Asia using the dinosaur's immense strength. He is recorded as saying, A single one of my favorite beasts is worth a thousand horses in battle. To my great lament, it eats two thousand horses each campaign. He famously trained his own dinosaurian forces to eat enemy troops, both living and dead, in order to cut campaign costs. Then there's Shanti Titan Annex, the peaceful Titan King. After hippos went extinct, young Alamosaurus began to find some refuge from predators by hiding in river systems and swamps. The adventurous among them ventured further to the coast, gradually becoming better adapted for a semi-aquatic lifestyle as the Akita Venator rampaged behind them. They exploited the nutrient-rich waters and had no evolutionary pressure to leave, becoming the equivalent of a gigantic reptile hippo. Shanti Titan have stout bodies and legs and dense bones, with short thick tails to help propel them in the water. They thrive in large river systems, lakes, and the ocean shallows, feeding on water plants of all varieties. Adult Shanti Titan averaged 70 tons in mass, with the largest recorded, a massive female of the ocean-going subspecies, weighing 312 tons and measuring over 35 meters in length. They've dropped osteoderms in favor of thick, blubbery skin, and their teeth have become broad and crushing in order to take advantage of shells and small organisms they may find among seaweed and kelp. They use powerful infrasonic rumbles to communicate with one another, strong enough to create rippling patterns on the surface of the sea that can be seen from miles away. These patterns are unique to each individual, functioning as names. Their language appears to be even more complex, although we haven't yet cracked the code further. They have no natural predators. 
Our third variant split off from the Shanti Titan line nearly two million years after the original Alamosaurus population arrived in the Cenozoic. Rather than ballooning into shallow water behemoths, these animals took to the open ocean and became sleek, plesiosaur-like predators known as Thalassoraksha Chaya, the shadow monsters of the ocean. Their long tails became paddles, their broad feet expanded into powerful fins, and their enormous stomachs shrank, with some pockets of tissue becoming secondary swim bladders. It was an easy transition for their peg-like teeth to become sharp and their jaws elongated. They are the world's foremost hunter of giant squid, a lifestyle enabled by their enormous eyes and darting movements. Their bioluminescent patterns are effective for intraspecific communication and warning lay rivals, like their competitor sperm whales. Females average 20 to 30 tons and live in harems with dominant bulls, who often weigh in excess of 90 tons. Bulls are known to battle sperm whales for access to areas of deep ocean rich in giant squid, and the mangled corpses of both species have washed up on shores across the world. While they typically remain in deep water, attacks on fishing boats have been reported with increasing frequency. It's suspected that the Lassoraksha attacks have always been common, but that older vessels simply were unable to survive long enough to communicate danger to the mainland. And that's it for today's episode of Thrive, Reading Alive. Big thanks to the Bone Pit, the Megasauropod member who chose Alamosaurus as his species profile. I've been trapped on the Kawashini World Eater ship for over a month now, and they were kind enough to give me a break from hybrid design in order to work on this project for you guys. The Nakarak is one tough beast, but I think I know how to beat it. At any rate, Overseer's fight, the Trial of Sky, is happening first. Maybe I should go help him out. Nah, he's Australian. He'll be fine. I'm the Vividen, and I'll see you next time.